Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, first, I want to thank um, Talk.CSS and Hackerspace for hosting us. I know it takes a lot of effort um, to make this happen, so thank you so much. Um, and so my talk today is going to be um, the int introduction to Flux. It's actually Red Flux. Um, and my name is Ayaka Sasaki. Um, so I just want to have um, a quick show of hands. Who has heard of Flux? No one. OK, great. So this is going to be something new to you all. Um, so Flux is actually a CSS organization methodology, or CSS architecture. Um, and it's actually quite um, widely used in Japan. Um, but probably unknown in every other part of the world. So, um, OK, so let's get going. Um, agenda for today, I'm going to give a quick introduction of myself, um, talk about some problems, potential problems with CSS, um, quick tips to writing maintainable CSS, um, what Flux is, my refactoring experience, and pro some problems with Flux. Um, OK, so starting, um, my name is Ayaka. I'm a freelance web designer and developer. Um, I'm Japanese, but I was brought up in Singapore. Um, I was teaching web design in Japan, and I sort of co-founded a web development and design company in Japan. Yes, and you can find me on GitHub and Twitter and everything. OK, so um, talking about some problems with CSS, um, when I usually have tasks for CSS, I usually get assigned an ongoing project or a new project. So I think that's the same with you all. Um, and whenever I go into an ongoing project, I'm, I'm very excited. I'm like, yes, I get to see the CSS structure of this company. Like, let's go. Um, and then I go in and I see like everything's on fire. <laughs> so sometimes I see like dot orange, and inside the selector I see like color green. And I'm like, how can be this dot dot orange? So I'm guessing they changed their brand color, but they didn't update their selectors or something. Um, so it's either it's already on fire or um, I start a new project myself, um, and I start writing um, my CSS. I structure my CSS, and I'm like, yay, this is going really well. Like, This looks really great. Um, and then after a month, I'm just like, um, maybe like a new, uh, a new, I don't know, uh, like a new project comes in. Like, oh, Ayaka, can you please add this to you know, your project? I'm like, sure. Uh, where should I write it? OK, I'll just put it here for now. I'll change it later on. And then about two months later, I'm like, oh, OK, this is getting a bit itchy, but it's OK. I'll just carry on. Um, and then after like a five months or six months, I just find myself drowning in CSS. Um, and so what I want to point out is that there are some potential problems with CSS. Um, and they can be um, due to these four factors. Um, so maybe you first. Um, the impact of changing each CSS is really hard to tell um, since it's global. Um, since CSS is a global scope, um, you can change one CSS and it can change your whole project. Um, and second, selectors fighting each other for prominence. So you might have a lot of nested selectors. Um, and once you have nested selectors, you start using classes. <coughs> and then once you have classes, you start using IDs to overcome classes. And then once you have IDs, you start using important to overcome that, and then you're like dead <laughs> because you have no way to overwrite importance. Um, so that's the second problem. Um, and third, you start repeating yourself over and over again. So maybe you're writing um, CSS, and then you realize that you've written this code two weeks ago, um, but you just decide to leave it because you're not bothered to go back to it. Um, or even worse, you might even have unused CSS. So. Um, some people just like keep it there, like not bother to delete it. Um, and fourth, anyone can come and destroy your code. So you might have a new team member. Um, you might not have the time to share your documents or talk through your code. Or even if you do, it still happens. Um, someone can just come and destroy your code. Um, and this is some statistics. This is actually from um, SitePoint.com um, results. Uh, Ultimate CSS Survey 2017. Um, so this is some statistics about how many people are actually conscious about maintaining their code, their CSS code. Um, and you can see that the first and second uh, categories, like these people um, try to maintain their code to some extent. Um, so that's about 80% of the people. And, 20 and the other 20% are not too sure whether they keep their code maintainable. So you can see that 
maybe one in five people are still not very conscious of keeping their code maintainable. And so to overcome these, these problems with CSS, um, I guess one way to overcome it is CSS architecture. Um, and there's some famous ones, OO, CSS, Max, Ben, and a lot more. Um, and according to the survey, um, so Ben is the first, uh, the most popular, I guess, and the second, a combination of two or more of the above. Um, and then comes Max, OCSS, Atomic CSS, CS modules, and so on. Um, but what's surprising is that um, some people don't use systems. Um, and if you add the first category and the fourth category, I think it adds up to more than 40%. So more than 40% of people actually don't use CSS methodology, which is a bit frightening. Um, but it actually makes sense because CSS architecture is not not very simple. There's many things to start worrying about. For example, how abstract do you want to make your components? Um, you might have a simple case where you have an image on the left and a text on the right, right? So maybe you might com come up with a class dot image left. But then what happens if you have a video on the left and the text on the right? So are you going to make a dot video right class? You probably don't want to, right? So you probably want to make a dot media left and a uh, dot text write class or something. So how abstract do you want to make your components? But on the other hand, if you make it too abstract, people start not knowing, not understanding where to use it, where to use your components. Like, where should I use this component so abstract? Like, I don't know where to use it. Um, so it's really hard to get that right amount of um, abstract abstraction. And second, naming your components. This is sort of linked to the first question. But even something as simple as, are you going to name your buttons B-U-T-T-O-N or B-T-N is, like, is, a, is a simple like, problem, right? Like, do you want to name it differently or do you want to name it um, button? Because um, you don't want to have B-U-T-T-O-N in one part of your CSS and then B-T-N on another part of your CSS because that doesn't make any sense. And third, um, you want to start, um, you, like you want to think about how to categorize your components. Come in. <laughs> Sorry, everyone's blocked the side, but feel free to come in. <laughs> um, yes, so as I was talking about, um, you have to start worrying about how to categorize your components. You don't want to have all your components in one file, otherwise you're gonna have a huge CSS file, um, and you're gonna be scrolling through your CSS for your whole day. So you want to categorize your components, but in what way um, is the problem, I guess. And fourth, when to refactor, refactor an existing element. So you might have an element which you're thinking is not the best, but is it now that I want to refactor, or is it me, or is it has to be someone else? Um, so yeah, even like CSS architecture alone, there's a lot of things to worry about. Um, and you can realize that CSS architecture is really hard because CSS is so fragile. It's like you're trying to fix this puzzle and one part just always seems to pop out and you can never get it perfect. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm not an expert at writing CSS. I'm not, I don't think this is like the perfect answer, but I have, I do have some tips to write, to writing maintainable CSS. Um, so first, delete unneeded child selectors. Um, you don't want selectors nesting, 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 nesting. You want short, succinct um, selectors, especially if you have a huge project. Um, second, don't use IDs or tags as selectors. I think these are quite commonly said, it's quite common, right? Like no one uses IDs, like that's what you think, right? Um, but then I saw the survey and then it says, do you currently use IDs as selectors in your CSS files? And 37% said yes. I'm like, why? So apparently there are some people who use IDs as selectors, but please don't because IDs have high specificity and you're gonna have a hard time overwriting your IDs. And also you don't wanna use tags as selectors because um, it's going to be, your CSS is going to be dependent on your HTML, and you never want that. Um, and third, use important as last resort. If you really have to use it, okay, go ahead, but try not to use it as much as you can. Um, fourth, create reusable class selectors if possible. So um, if you have some repeating patterns in your website, you're going to want to 
um, create a class that, that is re reusable for all those patterns um, and not creating, not writing CSS for every single pattern. Um, and the fourth, um, I call it the rule of three, but um, it can be the rule of four or rule of five. You just want to decide on a number. Um, and what number that is, is that the time, the, 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 the time, the pattern is repeating, right? So if you have, for example, if you have a card um, with an image and a text, and if you have it once, you probably don't want to make it abstract, right? Um, because it's only gonna happen once. But if you're gonna happen, have, an, have it three times, four times, five times, then you're gonna start wanting to create a class that actually um, encompasses all those three, all, all those um, cards. So I call it the rule of three. If you have three cards, um, then you want to make it a component. If you have three buttons, you're going to make it a component. Um, yeah, It doesn't have to be three, but I just call it three. Um, and this was already done. Um, and then continuing some more tips. Um, don't apply styles to JavaScript elements. Um, I don't think a lot of people do, but I've seen places which does. Um, and so if you're going to use a class as a target for your um, JavaScript or, or as a hook, um, you don't want to put styles onto that class or ID or whatever. Um, and next, uh, no inline styles, please, unless you're writing CSS and JS. So if you're writing CSS and JS, it's totally fine. But unless you're going to do that, never, never write inline styles. I had one, one, one project where I went in and I saw inline styles all over the place and I was like, oh my god. Never write inline styles, please. And fourth and fifth, I highlighted because this is the part which Flux can cover, which um, a CSS architecture can cover. So you want to break CSS into different categories, and you also want to have a naming rule. Is everyone keeping up? Is everyone okay? Okay, great. Um, okay, so now we're gonna go into Flux. Um, it sounds very new, I guess, like very different. But it's actually just a jumble of O, CSS, Max, Ben, so CSS. So if any of you know Ben Showpants, oh really? No one knows Ben. Okay, yeah. Or O CSS, like object-oriented CSS, yes. Um, then you already know a part of Flux, or actually a most part of Flux. Um, so Flux is um, a, a CSS methodology where you break your CSS into different layers or different categories. Um, and there's six layers. Um, foundation, layout, object, component, project, utility. And component, project, and utility is a part of object. So that's where the FLO comes from for Flux CSS. Um, and you can see, if you want to see the directory structure, so foundation, layout, and object is at the for foremost end. And then you have component, project, and utility inside object, the object layer. And then I'll be talking about these layers individually. So first, I'll be talking about the foundation layer. <coughs> um, so this is similar to the base layer in Smacks, if any of you have heard of Smacks. Um, so you're going to be write, wanting to write your CSS resets, um, your default styles. And also, if you have like a brand color or colors you want to use throughout your project or typography, um, maybe fonts, font sizes, you want, you're going to want to put these in, in, a, in a variable CSS. Um, and these are going to be inside the foundation layer. Yeah, so this is where you, bu you build your CSS um, up on. Um, and then you're going to have your layout layer. Um, and here you're going to have your major components or your containers or blocks or whatever you call it. Um, so examples include header, headers, sidebars, content areas. There's meant to be a comma there, sorry. Content areas and footers. Um, and so these components should only exist once in a page. So you should, be, you should be feeling comfortable using an ID selector here. So like if you put a sharp in front of header, like sharp header seems okay. You're never gonna have two headers in your web page. <coughs> um, sharp sidebar seems fine, unless you're gonna have two sidebars, like on the left, on the, on the right, in which case you're gonna have a sharp left sidebar, sharp right sidebar, um, and a sharp footer sounds fine too. So um, for the layout layer, you can use an ID selector, but since ID has high specificity, you don't want to use IDs. You can use a prefix, a prefix of dot L hyphen. So you're going to have dot L hyphen header 
dot l hyphen sidebar dot l hyphen footer and so on and so on. Um, and so in Flux, we always use a prefix to um, differentiate between different layers. Um, and also just a small caveat, in Smacks, um, grid frameworks are included in this layer, in this layout layer, but in Flux, it's, it's included in the foundation layer. So if you want to use grid frameworks, like Bootstrap or some other Flexbox grids, you're gonna put it into the foundation, not the layout. Okay, and moving on, um, the object layer. So this is based on OOCSS. Um, so you're gonna want to put visual patterns that are used repeatedly in a project. So um, I'll explain that later on. And this object layer can be categorized into three more layers. So the first is the component layer. Um, you're gonna want to put your buttons, your inputs, your tabs, your, your labels, um, or your titles, anything that repeats itself over and over again. Um, I put more than three times, but you can say more than four times. It's really up to you. Um, and if possible, your components should have minimum styling. So don't try to set um, a particular width for your button, because in another page, you're gonna want to, I don't know, you're gonna want to pull the button wider or maybe something else, um, and you're not gonna have that flexibility if you put, your, if you put a set width. Um, and also try to not avoid Avoid set, um, setting a color for your component, if possible. But if it's set, I guess you could um, include it. And the prefix is dot c hyphen. Sorry, my rectangle is a little off. OK, and then the second layer for um, your object layer is the project layer. Um, and these are patterns that are unique to a certain project. So beside for your, from your main website, you might have another uh, blog maybe like a, a blog for your company. Or if you're running an e-commerce website, you might have a payment page that has a different button styling than your main EC website or something. So if you have a unique, uh, different project, certain project that is, um, you know, the, the style is deviating from your, your main project, um, then you want to put it inside the project there. Um, and the prefix starts with dot p hyphen. And lastly, um, you have your utility layer. Um, and util and uh, classes in the utility layer are used to style slight changes in styles that cannot or should not be solved by component or project layers. Um, so for example, if you have a button and you want to move it down by 10 pixels, you don't want to put it in your component, right? Because it's going to affect your whole website. Your, your whole website is going to have buttons which are 10 pixels on the bottom. So in that case, you can create a utility um, class. So for example, dot, uh, if you want to move your button down by 10 pixels, um, so margin top 10 pixels, then you want to have, you, might, you want to make a class dot u mt 10, margin top 10 pixels, um, and you can use that as your uh, like fallback, I guess. And for Flux, um, we name our selectors by using BEM. Um, if you don't know BEM, I'm sorry, but I probably don't have time to go through BEM, so please Google it. Um, but it's basically um, using block element modifier. Um, so if you have a block, um, underscore it and link it to an element and hyphen hyphen modifier. Uh, yes. And if it's possible, try not to use um, uh, a selector that's too long. So for example, don't have a block element element, don't have a block element modifier modifier that's <coughs> usually too long and it gets your code really messy. So try to keep it short, especially with your prefixes. Okay. Um, and this is just another quick thing, but if you're gonna have states, so if your button is active, if your button is disabled, you're going to want to have a prefix dot is, so dot is active. Um, or dot di is disabled. Um, and this isn't uncommon, so it shouldn't be anything new to a lot of you. Um, and just one um, caveat, um, make sure not to put any styling onto the states, um, but make sure to combine it with a component. So if, if you, you, so you don't want to have dot is active brackets something inside. You want to combine it with a button or you want to combine it with something else. Okay. 
so um, by now, I hope you're all thinking, okay, like block sounds okay, um, but I don't really know where to start, and I don't know when to start, and I'm really scared because my CSS is like huge. I don't want to start. Um, so I think I'm going to start sharing my refactoring experience. Um, yes. Um, so where to start? I know this sounds really terrifying, but trust me, this is the best way. So first, if you want to refactor your CSS, just print out every single page of your website. Um, and this sounds horrific, but do it because it's actually shorter. It's actually the shortcut. Um, so print out every single page of your website. And then you want to cut out each object or what, what you want to create as a component. Um, and you want to find a name and a layer for it. Um, and trust me, if you have a teammate, you want to go through this with your teammate because it's really amazing how your teammate will never agree with you. So it's like, no, I think this is going to be in the component. And then your teammate will be like, no, it's obviously it's in the, I don't know, project layer or something. Um, so you're going to um, consult your teammates about what name and what layer to put it in. Um, yes. Oh, shoot. OK, sorry. The, there was meant to be a picture here, but never mind. Um, and then third, um, after that, I actually categorized every object onto a spreadsheet. So I had my objects. I had about 60 objects. And I placed them all on a spreadsheet. Um, but this was a really terrible mistake because I never had the flexibility to move it around. And it was like a nightmare. You know, you don't want to like scroll through your spreadsheets. Um, so I recommend you stick it up on the wall. So if you have a huge wall that you can work with, um, put one of your cutout components onto, stick it onto the wall, and make sure you have categories. Um, so make sure you um, place each object and stick it up on the wall. And then you can see, OK, I've got this much components to work through. It's a lot, but it seems manageable, right? So you can see like what you're going to go through after this. Um, and then after this, it's really easy. Make each object a task. If you use Trello, just put it up as a task on Trello. Or if you use something else, yeah, just assign yourself a task. Um, and just run through all of them. <laughs> yeah, usually you can get through um, maybe three to four objects a day. But then when you get used to it, you can get through more. Um, and you can take out every object that you've done from the wall. Um, and make sure you, you um, make each object a pull, pull request or a merge request if you use GitLab. Um, and yeah, make sure to get it checked. Yes. And lastly, I'm going to talk about some problems with Fox. Um, so even speaking about Fox, I do feel like there is a lot of um, things that can be uh, made better. Um, and the first thing is that Flux itself is quite complicated. Um, some people don't really know where to start. And if, for example, if someone's new coming in, maybe they don't know Flux, like, and you've created this whole like maze of CSS, and they might not want to co cooperate with you. So sometimes um, it's hard to maintain it, um, especially your naming conventions, um, and also where you want to put your oops, new classes. Yep. Um, so it should it go into, into the component layer or the project layer? Yeah, maybe someone's like, OK, who cares? Like, I'll just put it anywhere. Um, and that destroys everything. So, uh, so it is actually a bit complicated. So make sure your newcomers, you know, you have documents prepared for your newcomers so that they can um, catch up with everything you've done. And third, if you're doing, if you're just carrying out a small project, it's not suitable because it's just too complicated. Um, and yeah, it's not worth the energy. So if you have a huge project, um, yeah, may maybe like start using it. But if not, forget about it. Um, maybe some other day. Uh, yep, uh, that's it. Thank you so much. And you can find me on these places. Um, and have a great night. If you have some any questions, um, feel free to consult me. Or you can just use Google, because <laughs> they might have uh, better information. Yep. <laughs> uh, that's all. Thank you. So anyone has questions for Ayaka? I mean, we have five minutes, if not.
Yeah. Yeah, I think the rain. It's just. But I have a question though. Oh, okay. <laughs> so let's say, uh, so if I have, if I have a huge code base of CSS, uh huh, what would be the easiest and simplest way to have flux in committed? Um, it's it's still gonna be a long process. So as you said, you have to print out everything and. Yes. Um, I find that that's the easiest way, but but actually it reduces your your CSS a lot. Mm -hmm. It reduces it a lot. So I've heard stories where they had twenty thousand lines of CSS and it became nine thousand. Mm -hmm. So um, it does help if you have a huge amount of CSS. If not, just write CSS as it is. It's it's not going to change your web speed, your your performance a lot. But if you do have a huge CSS file, okay. um, as in the before and after. You have to basically test it and make sure that everything looks all right and the same as before. Yes, but um, yeah, so that's the huge problem. But usually, you're going through your um, tasks one by one, so you're you're changing <coughs> objects one by one. So it shouldn't be, you shouldn't have many problems. But um, okay, yeah, because CSS is cascading, <coughs> then you change something and some somewhere else in the universe gets changed. Yes, exactly. So that's why. Yeah, yeah. If you're if you're going to change it, um, dump your old CSS. Like, don't even think of starting with your old CSS. Just dump it, like everything. Like, don't use it any of it. Maybe except for your default so CSS. So start with a fresh. Yes, start with a fresh page. Um, so yes, it's going to take a lot of time, and you start feeling bad because everyone's like, you guys haven't done anything. <laughs> you know, like. The website hasn't changed, and you're taking like three months, four months, but it takes a lot of time. Um, at first, our team said we're going to do this in one month, um, and then after one month, we're like, maybe this time is going to take a bit more time. So give yourself some time and cheer up your team, cheer up your teammates because they're going to feel the mental, stress. you know, yes, stress there. So, um, but after you're done, you're going to feel like. Oh my god, you know, CSS is so much better now. And it's it's easier to change on um, like create changes, make changes after you've um you know yeah, structurized your CSS, organized your CSS. So. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh. Thank oh, you. Uh reading of the discussion, uh, I, I'm just curious, uh, I'm from a programming uh, uh -huh. background, right? So are uh, there such thing as an uh, automated unit test for CSS because like, when you change the CSS right some something the color or brand color will change right? mm -hmm. uh, are there some, some, some kind of like automated test for CSS or it's all based on human uh, human self um, I think in terms of grammar we have like automated tests and also I talked about unused CSS but there's also tests for unused CSS but in terms of checking whether you know the 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 website st still s remains the same style. I don't I don't think I, I think you just have to look by eye ch check by eye. Yeah. Yeah, there are some ways that people actually take screenshots. Of yes, there we go. <laughs> and then you just run an automated test after you push out a request. And that progress will run through that oh. automation. Oh, that's cool. But it takes a lot of them. Okay. Yeah. It was cool test. Oh, that's cool though. You <laughs> happen to know what is the testing framework uh, so that everyone can... I remember it's, it's, it's one called new... I think Facebook has one called Huxley. Huxley. Huxley, I think. Okay. But I never used it. There's a new company that does yeah. that as well. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to... To become exactly the same, like to one pixel, does it? Is my is my question? Well, not <laughs> <laughs> it depends on the, the, the problem. Part of the problem with it is that if you do an image date, right, then literally every pixel counts. Right, exactly. It's, it's, it's so totally if you have like a one pixel difference, it's gonna, mm. right? Yeah, exactly what you said. Uh, is there is there an English language reference for box on that? That's a great question. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, I, I just looked at my phone and uh, everything was Japanese. Yes, so everything where, where would we go next? Uh, you might want to come to me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I can do the translation. I was thinking of um, um, issuing a pull request um, because there's an issue up there saying there's no English translation. Um, 
I'll do it someday. <laughs> um, if you give me some time. Yeah, but um, you can talk to the developer. Um, his name is H I L O K I Hiroki, and I'm pretty sure he speaks English. So, yeah. Okay. Cool. So, without any more questions, uh, thank you. Yes. Ayaka. Thank you. Yeah.